Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Gigaspace's massively scalable real-time risk analysis webinar. The webinar will begin shortly. I apologize for the delay. We're just waiting for all of the participants to join. Your, your patience is appreciated. While we wait for additional participants and just to fill the time, a few brief words about Gigaspaces. Gigaspaces Technologies is a leading provider of next generation application platforms providing end-to-end -end scaling solutions for distributed mission critical application environments and cloud onboarding technologies. Gigaspaces is the industry's only solution for end-to-end -end scaling in a single platform. Hundreds of enterprises worldwide are leveraging Gigaspaces technology to enhance IT efficiency and performance, as well as reduce costs, including Fortune Global 500 companies across industries, including e-commerce companies, online gaming providers, telecom carriers, through top financial services enterprises, which will also be the focus of our webinar today. All of the solutions we provide for enterprises are also provided for easy onboarding of mission-critical apps to the cloud where we have premier partners in this space helping us achieve this goal, including Microsoft, with a dedicated solution Cloudify for Azure, Citrix, and CA, among others. We're happy to see that there are quite a few participants that are not from the financial sector, and with this in mind, we made every effort to ensure that the webinar will be beneficial for non-financial sector participants as well. At this time, I'd like to present our host for this webinar, Dutan Horowitz. Datan Horowitz is a senior solution architect for Gigaspaces who leads the consulting and education services as well as partners in EMEA and APAC. In this capacity, Datan has served as the principal architect and consultant for Gigaspaces customer projects, many of which are Fortune 100 corporations across various market verticals, including e-commerce, telecom, and has special expertise architecting solutions for financial services around trading, trade reconciliation, and the topic of today's webinar, Risk Management Solutions. Dotan has over a decade of experience in development, system engineering, and architecture, as well as enterprise middleware platforms, high-performance scalable and elastic systems, as well as grid and cloud technologies. Joining Dotan will be special guest panelist, Mr. Larry Mitchell. Larry Mitchell is president and founder of the Winton Group, a business strategy and product management consultancy focused on the needs of treasury and capital markets. Mr. Mitchell has more than 20 years experience in senior business and IT management roles in both buy side and sell side for some of the world's leading financial institutions, including Chase Manhattan Bank, Morgan Stanley, and Citgo Group, and has served as an advisor to companies such as Progress Software, Avian Amro, HSBC, and Numerics. His professional his professional accomplishments include moving hedge fund administration into the middle office, overseeing the delivery of centralized risk management and reporting for a leading global bank, directing the European Monetary Union Program of Change at one of the largest investment banks, and managing the life cycle of a treasury and capital market software portfolio. The agenda for this webinar. Dotan Horowitz will begin with an introduction to Gigaspaces and financial services. Mr. Larry Mitchell will then continue to provide an overview of the risk management domain and its challenges. Dotan will walk you through the evolution of risk analysis solution architectures. And then we will open up the session for some questions and answers. So without further ado, I would now like to welcome Dotan, who will be leading the webinar. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us on this uh, webinar. In this webinar, I'd like to share with you some of uh, my experience consulting uh, uh, to customers on architecting scalable near real-time risk analysis systems. In recent years, uh, and especially following the uh, 2008 crash, we noticed an increasing interest in uh, complex risk analysis systems uh, with the regulatory changes and with dedicated budgets assigned for, uh, for that. With that growth of, uh, of our customer base in this domain, we gathered experience uh, in such architectures. And uh, on this webinar, I'd like to share that experience with you and uh, discuss architectural patterns for such systems. Gigaspace has been catering for customers in financial services for over a decade. We serve tens of major banks, uh, stock exchange uh, 
and, and trading firms on all leading markets, whether Wall Street or the city or Hong Kong and so forth, um, many of which are Fortune 100 corporations. And uh, we've been offering these customers middleware platforms for the solutions for uh, trading, trade reconciliation, uh, market data, and um, of course the focus of the, today's webinar, uh, the risk management solutions. So uh, Gigaspace's platforms lie in the heart of uh, risk analysis solutions for uh, various kinds of uh, risk challenges, whether commodities, fixed income, VAR equities, and more. Many of our uh, customers uh, actually approach us after traditional architecture has reached uh, its scaling limit and uh, cannot long, can no longer meet the new challenges uh, of uh, volumes and of uh, uh, regulations and so on. Out of uh, the accumulated experience, we learned the needs and the challenges of this uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, solutions and we've developed effective architectures to meet them. Um, by the way, uh, I found these architectural patterns useful for uh, similar challenges in other domains uh, such as e-commerce, telco, healthcare and others. So uh, uh, for uh, those who join us that are not exactly from risk management, I'm sure that you will also uh, find these uh, uh, quite interesting and useful. So uh, when we look at the uh, risk analysis uh, problem from an architectural point of view, uh, what do we see? First of all, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, uh, risk analysis is, um, is a compute-intensive and a, a data-intensive process. And um, equally as important, uh, it has an elaborate uh, orchestration logic. We see uh, ever-increasing volumes of uh, whether in the number of users, the number of uh, calculated positions and assets, the uh, number of recalculations required per day uh, or per iteration, uh, we see the complexity of the financial instruments increasing and with that, of course, the data affinity and the uh, interdependencies between the calculations. So uh, this is definitely a, a massive volume uh, uh, challenge. And with that, we see uh, an ever-increasing demand to uh, reduce the response time, whether for a competitive edge or uh, to conform to uh, industry standards and regulations. So uh, we are facing here definitely a uh, high performance system, but uh, happily uh, at its core, architecturally speaking, the risk analysis problem is ideal for parallel processing. Now in order to uh, better understand the uh, volumes, the regulations and all of these observed trends in uh, risk management, I'd like to invite our distinguished guest, uh, leading expert in the field, Mr. Larry Mitchell. Larry, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dotan, and thank you very much for Gigaspaces for this opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, I think any conversation about risk management in uh, 2011 or 2012 has got to start on the uh, capital markets uh, regulations. Um, we're see we've seen uh, um, laws passed in the U.S. and Europe, um, and of course we see rulemaking coming from the Basel III Committee. Um, all driving around higher capital requirements, uh, new liquidity management, uh, modified market structures, especially in OTC derivatives, and stricter supervision. And we want to really look at the implications of these changes in this call. Um, while the, the environment is, the, the laws are passed, the rulemaking is still underway by the various uh, organizations within the government. Um, we've seen about 350 rules done out of what we expect to be 1,400 in the U.S. So it, it, it's all moving, but there's still uncertainty. But given that, it's very clear that we're going to need to solve the data problem, and we're going to need to solve the computational problem, regardless of the de as the details come in on these rules. Um, the expenditures on data management and analytics uh, in IT, risk management IT, um, are expected to average $350 million over the next three years, between now and 2014, when Basel is due on average per bank, so 350 million per bank, ranging from 200 million per bank to a billion per bank. So this is a big deal. Now, if we take a look at what the regulators have said about uh, risk IT, um, uh, about a year ago, a, the Senior Supervisors Group, um, which is comprised of bankers and regulators from um, most of the, of the Western countries in the U.S. and Europe, 
excuse me, in uh, North America and Europe, um, uh, reviewed and came out with an interesting document. I've never seen regulators actually uh, opine on IT infrastructure before. Um, and while it's a big document, and you can find it online, um, there are three points that I want to highlight today. The, the one is that they realize that few firms can actually quickly aggregate risk data without manual intervention. So risk managers post-crash were running around collecting data from systems in ad hoc, probably in spreadsheet, uh, building their risk positions. Um, two, there are some banks that have invested a lot of money, and I've been parts of some of those banks. Um, in covering all of their transactional accounting systems to build data repositories that are comprehensive for all of the businesses within a, uh, a trading operation. Um, and, and what they did is they automated everything end to end. And one way that got accomplished was through defining standards for all of the, uh, the hundreds or thousands of trading platforms to deliver um, data into that central point so that they had a central view of their inventory. And it's expected that this is going to be really mandated going forward by the regulators. Next slide, please. In the traditional risk IT approach, um, we did uh, Basel I in the early 90s, actually. Um, so that was the first time that people really looked at the capital uh, ratios um, across trading organizations. The approach was very simple. We, we populated a single database globally with uh, market and transaction data in a, in a data warehouse using relational database technology. We did, then did overnight batch processing, sometimes three, days, uh, three times a day batch processing as each of the markets closed in Asia, Europe, and the US. We ag then aggregated those results, ran the calculators, ran, aggregated the results, generated reports, and distributed them to end users, the many stakeholders in a financial institution that need this data. Next slide, please. What, what we learned was that the problem with overnight runs is that traders see the risk data as stale. So when somebody from uh, credit risk or market risk approaches a trader about a, an approaching limit, um, um, that, that better be up to date. And uh, in most times in these days, it was not. Um, Often the risk calculations that were done centrally were, were derived from different pricing calculations uh, than, the, than the front office community used. And again, that made the numbers easy to ignore. Uh, in building all those reports, um, reports are really essentially underneath them predefined queries. And um, it became very obvious that people, as they looked at this data, um, needed to ask that next question, and the last thing he wanted to do was put a programmer between uh, getting that next answer um, and, uh, and, and the user who needed it. So um, that was too slow. And um, for those banks that actually invested in grids and grid technology to do the calculation, it became very clear that the, uh, there were great data affinity issues. You couldn't get the data to do the risk run fast enough into the grid to, get the, uh, to keep the grids busy. From a functional standpoint, um, really nothing has changed. Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got the, uh, the, the number of transaction processing uh, systems and reference data systems for commercial counterparties uh, in an organization, front back office uh, trading systems, uh, uh, commercial lending, margin of collateral systems, and then, of course, all the reference data. This all gets pushed into a consolidated database, uh, not all of it, but the obviously the data elements that are relevant. Uh, then we calculate risk measures, and the whole series of them listed there for you. Um, and then you really need to then build the, do the risk analysis and reporting. This is, in some sense, a massive pivot table or spreadsheet. Um, so people, people can drill down, drill back in time, do their attribution analysis, understand what changed. People need to have alerts so that if limits are approached, uh, people are alerted. Uh, Obviously, simulations off of uh, various financial scenarios are required uh, for, for all these different types of risk, uh, regional risk, all sorts of slice and dices um, um, that the people who consume this and use this information to make decisions um, need to have their hands on.
what's changed in the new in the new regulation is there are a series of risk metrics that are intended to be treat pre-trade metrics. Um, one of these, which I would call the mother of all risk measures, is called CVA, uh, credit valuation, uh, credit value adjustment. And the idea of um, CVA is that uh, the credit charge gets added to the price of the trade, depending on who it is that they're trade that the bank is trading with, and um, that's going to require a huge amount of data and near real time performance to get that data, especially in the OTC world, very challenging to get that data in the hands of a trader on an enterprise-wide basis. Um, so we've got a real-time capture and aggregation of all the trade and market data, uh, the disk calculation, obviously on the fly uh, uh, aggregation, um, and then the need for ticking and most likely web-based, given that we're looking at a global footprint for this, um, but a centralized um, data store um, the, the web technology is probably the best way to distribute that through the organization. And of course, the need to get historical data so we can do as of analysis and understand what changed over time. One of the other interesting challenges, um, you'll see in the middle there a unified data sourcing model um, getting filled, um, essentially it's a copy of the systems of records on the right-hand side under data services, all sorts of different types of data from legal and compliance data, trading, reference data, counterparty data, market data, all flowing in. Uh, of course, that data uh, changes under different frequencies. Some of it's daily. Uh, some of it changes, um, you know, three and a half million times a second. So uh, really quite a uh, quite a beast, a lot of data uh, moving there. One of the things that's um, likely to happen, and I understand that this is coming from a, uh, uh, an existing global bank's uh, architecture, if you take a look at the federated components, is that there becomes a single source of both pricing analytics and pricing data. So the front office ends up pricing off the same models as the risk, um, as the risk service that we see in the, in the bottom left there. Um, so a single set of valuation routines and a single set of services running off of a single data source on demand. Now this is a major challenge. We've got a big data problem. We've got both a massive amounts of historical data uh, over time as well as um, all the data to create a cross-asset view of both market risk and the counterparty. Um, We've got a technology issue where we really need to get the uh, data grid to intersect with the compute grid in a way that makes that does that in a very efficient way. I was at a, a risk IT conference last Monday in New York, um, and the head of risk IT for I think it may be still the largest bank in the world um, um, stood up and said that 2012 will be the year where the data grid uh, meets the uh, compute grid. Um, and he's very concerned about this data affinity issue. And of course, all of this um, uh, technology needs to work in a fault tolerant way. Uh, under the new regulations, these systems become absolutely mission critical, need to be up 24 by 7, and therefore need to have both fault tolerance and the, and the data via disaster recovery failover in a way that's nonstop uh, for the institution. So uh, Doton is going to show us some of the ways that uh, Gigaspaces can help solve this problem, and therefore back to you, Doton. Uh, thank you, Larry, uh, very much for the uh, insight on the domain. Um, so as Larry stated, the risk analysis systems uh, rely uh, on specialized compute grid products for the uh, uh, calculation that have been traditionally uh, relying on relational databases for serving the data for the uh, uh, caching of the and, and for caching the calculation results. Now the question is: uh, Is risk analysis system only the mere sum of a compute grid product and a data uh, data store product? And uh, surprisingly, I noticed that many of our customers actually uh, seem to think so. But uh, as soon as they start developing these systems, they realize that there is actually a major piece of orchestration that needs to uh, be taken care of. Uh, for the uh, compute grid intersection with the data store, for uh, uh, handling uh, duplicate and avoiding duplicate calculation requests, for uh, uh, automatic expiration of cached uh, results, uh, 
for canceling uh, uh, calculations, for uh, monitoring the state of uh, uh, pending uh, calculation uh, requests, uh, for generating reports, and so on and so forth. All of that amounts to a, a significant uh, a layer of uh, orchestration that is traditionally uh, homegrown. So, um, compute grids uh, are the means to uh, scale the uh, uh, computation work, the calculations, and uh, we've been seeing uh, with our customers uh, deployments uh, of hundreds and even thousands of uh, compute engines. Uh, but uh, still computation is time consuming, so uh, architecturally speaking we need to cache results of course uh, to reduce the uh, computations and also to try and avoid uh, duplicate calculations and unnecessary uh, uh, recalculations. Uh, an addition challenge in the uh, solution is how to deliver data in a way that keeps the uh, compute nodes uh, busy. Uh, idle nodes mean slowing down the overall uh, calculation time and of course that will prevent us from uh, utilizing the capabilities of the compute grid. Uh, so how do we do that? And we are talking, as Larry uh, very nicely stated, uh, we are talking about massive volumes of uh, reference and streaming data uh, used for the calculations, well the uh, historical data, the streaming market data, the positions, the trades, the various types of reference data. Um, and uh, what we've seen with our uh, customers is that uh, uh, relational databases uh, uh, just don't cut it for these volumes. Uh, they tend to become a bottleneck due to the uh, uh, disk and the network resources. Um, database clustering solutions are extremely expensive uh, or are limited in scaling and, and that is actually a lesson well learned over uh, uh, quite a few of our customers. So the standard architecture for these is actually caching the intraday data in memory for, uh, for of course, uh, getting a, a blazing fast response time, uh, which also has the nice added value of, of a less error-prone system thanks to less uh, moving parts. Uh, but the question is, is simple caching solution enough for this, uh, this sort of uh, in-memory uh, uh, data store? And uh, uh, our experience shows that uh, actually uh, simple caching solutions just uh, cannot meet the required scaling challenges because we are talking about use cases that are uh, uh, very write intensive. We are talking about streaming data, uh, which is of course very write intensive operations and in order to scale write intensive systems, we need to uh, have a, a, a data store that uh, uh, allows sharding of the data and supports uh, cluster-wide transactionality. Uh, which means that we need uh, uh, an in-memory data grid to store the data reliably and in a scalable manner. Um, so uh, we are using a, a sharded in-memory data grid uh, and, uh, uh, and Gigaspaces app is a classic uh, example of that of course in our context and uh, with Gigaspaces app we can also get SQL querying uh, capabilities just as if we were doing that uh, with the relational databases. Uh, let's have a look at the snippet to see how it looks like. So you can see in this uh, uh, code snippet that I just ask uh, the Gigaspace uh, uh, to have instances of my class with the given WHERE clause, the SQL WHERE clause just as you know that from uh, uh, databases. Um, So, um, and there is actually quite another uh, added value of that. Uh, if, if you think about it, and that is that the query that you see here embedded is actually on the fly query. So, uh, uh, Larry stated very nicely that uh, one of the problems of the traditional systems is the need uh, for predefined queries, which is not flexible enough. And with this solution, of course, you see that uh, at the moment that I'm invoking the uh, read multiple operation, I just provide the uh, SQL query on the fly, which is a major advantage for these systems. Now, uh, another advantage uh, with the uh, Gigaspaces app is uh, to boost up the performance even further is to uh, use indexing. So if this is the, an, a class of the domain model and I would like to index uh, several properties, I just uh, do that declaratively using Java annotations and that is all that, is, uh, that it takes to uh, make these properties indexed and of course boost up performance 
for uh, queries based on these properties. So, um, as you can see, um, uh, there is a very similar problem uh, when regard with regards to uh, 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 calculation results and caching the calculation results. As we said before, uh, storing results significantly reduces the response time. But in order to enjoy to enjoy that, we uh, need a reliable and scalable data store. Uh, for the same reasons as before, the data, the relational databases just uh, are not enough uh, for these uh, write-intensive operations, uh, nor uh, 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 simple caching solutions. And we would, uh, uh, and the standard solution for that, the standard architecture is uh, leveraging on data grids for scaling the data uh, via sharding of the data. And what if you want uh, um, to have uh, uh, even, a re even further to reduce the response latency by performing on-the-fly result aggregation and cache it? Larry mentioned that nicely on, on his part uh, about the uh, result aggregation, and that is something that is quite common in this domain. Uh, but in order to do that, and to do that efficiently, we need uh, to have the ability not just for an in-memory data grid, but also for uh, the ability to execute a processing logic uh, co-located with the data uh, to make that efficient. Uh, by the way, very similarly, we might want to have a pre-processing logic, uh, for example, to align the uh, uh, format of incoming data uh, to st some, uh, one of the standards of uh, uh, finance. So this pre-processing or uh, post-processing logic is uh, uh, something that uh, we can actually get uh, out of the box in uh, Gigaspaces app um, uh, that allows the platform that allows uh, uh, collocation of the data with the processing and of course taking all of that both the data and the processing and providing the scalability via uh, sharding uh, of the data and the resilience via uh, maintaining resilient redundant sorry redundant copies uh, remotely uh, of the data. Um, we, we can also have the ability for a write behind to a database uh, so that uh, if we still need the data in a database uh, for a later uh, auditing and reporting uh, and of course the historical data then we can do that over the database uh, which is of course uh, if you look at it end to end is a basically a big data problem as, as Larry stated uh, because we keep the intraday uh, data in memory, we keep the uh, historical data in, uh, in some sort of a database, whether a relational database or the uh, 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 recent trend is, is for, for a NoSQL databases that uh, seem to uh, cope with the, these volumes much more efficiently. Um, and of course we would like to have an end-to-end -end ability for real-time analysis, which is something that Gigaspaces uh, Zap uh, provides, uh, but uh, probably I'll touch that uh, a bit more further later on. So how do you orchestrate it all? Uh, let's have a look at the simplest use case uh, of uh, requesting a, a calculation. So uh, a client requests a calculation. Of course, first we need to check if the uh, uh, result is already cached in the data grid. If so, then we can uh, serve it uh, synchronously to the client. If not, then we need to check if such a calculation already is in progress because, we want, because as we said before, we want to avoid duplicate calculations. So uh, that, of course, implies uh, some uh, lifecycle management and state management that the orchestration layer needs to maintain. Uh, if such a calculation uh, already exists, we just join it. If not, then we invoke the uh, compute grid uh, 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 for a computation. Then, uh, upon receiving asynchronously the computation results from the compute grid, we need to cache it uh, uh, back to the data grid and to serve it to its awaiting clients. As you can see, this is the simplest use case, and you can see already how much uh, of an overhead you have uh, in managing the orchestration. Um, and that's, of course, the simplest use case. Now, if you start thinking about uh, real-life scenarios where you need to uh, support uh, 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 avoiding duplicate computations and, um, and to uh, handle uh, cancellations of, of uh, computations, uh, or if you need to uh, handle uh, automatic expiration of uh, cached results based on some uh, predefined uh, uh, time to live or a, a lease, and uh, maybe later on you want to allow clients to then renew uh, an existing lease. 
uh, or maybe you want to monitor the uh, state of uh, pending uh, calculations or uh, generate reports uh, or uh, feed uh, uh, events to, uh, to UI, all of these challenges uh, make uh, orchestration quite a pain. And uh, that would have been very nice to have that all taken care of for us. And uh, we can actually uh, achieve that goal uh, by using an application pl platform that uh, uh, will be used not just for storing the calculation results in memory, uh, but would also uh, transparently uh, manage the calculation lifecycle and stream the uh, uh, results back to the clients as they arrive asynchronously uh, uh, via event-driven architecture. So that the client basically in, uh, needs only to, uh, to interact with the platform. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to actually interact neither with the compute grid nor with any other uh, uh, service, uh, whether messaging or orchestration or, a, or any other type of service. Uh, and the orchestration logic itself becomes embedded within the uh, uh, platform together with the in-memory data grid, which of course provides us with superior performance having both the processing and the messaging capabilities co-located with the data. Um, and of course, having all of that consolidated uh, uh, means uh, less uh, software and less hardware to purchase, to manage, uh, and to maintain, which of course, all in all, makes a much more uh, efficient uh, deployment. Um, Gigaspace Zap uh, offers out of the box the uh, uh, co-location of um, of uh, the data and the processing and the messaging together, uh, making it all, of course, uh, scalable and reliable uh, and making the architecture much simpler. So um, let's have a look and see how it looks like uh, with Gigaspaces app. Uh, let's, let's revisit uh, the orchestration. Uh, first of all, as I said, the uh, uh, Gigaspaces app has uh, the messaging capabilities. So uh, let's have a look at how it looks like. Uh, for point-to-point -point messaging, it's very simple. We call it that polling container, uh, which is basically just a, a Java bean that has a, a piece of code defining the uh, event template, what kind of data is of interest for this, uh, uh, for this piece of code. And the other piece of data is basically uh, what's the event listener uh, what's the uh, uh, data event handler for handling uh, uh, such that, uh, data as soon as such matching data is found. So as you see, it's pretty uh, uh, simple and pretty intuitive. Uh, very similarly, uh, we have the uh, ability to uh, stream uh, results asynchronously to clients. Let, let's have a look at how, how simple that one is. So I have here a client that uh, invokes an async read operation. Uh, async read operation just needs the uh, SQL query, as we, see, uh, as we saw before. And the other piece is basically a, a standard uh, listener where you define an event handling logic that will be invoked automatically upon receiving the event, uh, upon being notified of the event of this data uh, ready. So when we get the results back, we will just have that jumping and invoking the on result event handler on the client side. So it's pretty standard and pretty uh, uh, classic event handler uh, and event uh, uh, architecture uh, of Java. Uh, another type of, um, of architecture, of, uh, sorry, of uh, messaging that we have in uh, Zap is uh, sort of publish subscribe uh, mode of uh, messaging. Uh, we call that notify container. Uh, very sim similar to the polling container, to the point-to-point uh, -point one, you just define the template of the data that is of interest to you and the event handler to, event the, uh, to handle the matching data. Now, let's have a look at the uh, uh, flow, that the use case that we uh, checked before, the simplest one of, of basically requesting a calculation and see how it looks like in the new architecture. So the client basically uh, first uh, approaches the uh, platform requesting for the uh, calculation. Now the platform checks if such uh, calculation is already, the result is already cached. If so, it uh, synchronously returns it to the client. That's the easy part. If it doesn't find it in the cache, it is up to the platform to basically uh, dispatch calculation requests to the compute grid. Uh, 
The client doesn't need to do that. It's transparent to the client. The, the uh, application platform dispatches the requests, and by the way, it does that parallel, in a parallel manner by utilizing multiple parallel consumers, so it's very efficient. And upon receiving the results from the compute grid, uh, the platform processes the calculation results, writing it to the in-memory data grid, and feeding it, streaming it to the client via the uh, asynchronous API that we saw before. So as you can see, it's much simpler as far as the client is concerned, and the orchestration is embedded within the platform. So uh, let, let's recap just to see exactly what we've been through here. So we saw that traditional architectures uh, that rely on relational databases uh, are uh, problematic because relational databases tend to become uh, bottlenecks and slow down the uh, calculations, whether for network or for disk uh, 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 bottlenecks. And uh, we need the data store that provides an in-memory response time and is reliable and scalable under high loads. And again, keep in mind that we are talking about write intensive use cases. We also want uh, the ability to uh, perform pre-processing and post-processing on the data uh, and to execute orchestration logic on the data uh, co-located with the data. For that challenge, uh, we turn to the architecture uh, that uh, relies on an application platform that is uh, provides in-memory data grid, but furthermore provides also the uh, processing and the messaging co-located with the data, and have both the data processing and messaging all together scalable via sharding and uh, highly available by utilizing redundant copies. Um, Gigaspace's uh, Zap uh, provides us, and I think it's the only product out there that currently provides all of that out of the box in a single product. Uh, and of course, having all of that in a single product simplifies the production environment, the maintenance, the, the troubleshooting, uh, less hardware because you know don't need a special machine for messaging and a special machine for a database and so on. Uh, of course, less. A, a variety of skill sets for all of the uh, uh, involved uh, systems. Um, one thing that it's important for me to note uh, for uh, for uh, those who are not actually uh, uh, developing currently uh, risk uh, management solutions that these pa these architectural patterns that uh, I mentioned are applicable for other domains, uh, both in financial services and other uh, uh, verticals such as e-commerce, telco, healthcare. We've been using that successfully for many other uh, uh, similar challenges. So uh, uh, these are uh, pretty generic uh, uh, architectural patterns. So uh, just to uh, uh, have a, a quick look at uh, what the future holds for, uh, for such a solution architecture, where, where we can take these uh, solution architecture that I uh, just depicted uh, to the next level. So we have several places where we can, uh, where we can take it to the next level. The first one, uh, as, as, uh, as I mentioned, and Larry also uh, very clearly uh, uh, stated that, we are talking about a big data uh, uh, problem and, uh, and a real-time analytics problem. Uh, in, in this domain, basically, uh, the uh, standard solution is to keep the intraday data in memory. Uh, but the historical data, which is, of course, huge volumes of data, uh, is kept in a database. Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, we see more and more uh, 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 trend uh, towards the NoSQL databases, which in, in these huge volumes of terabytes and more of data uh, uh, tend to be much more efficient in providing these sorts of uh, capabilities. Um, uh, and real-time risk analysis uh, actually re requires running uh, analytics uh, on the aggregation of uh, both the intraday and the historical data in real time. And the question is how to achieve that. So uh, one option is, of course, to uh, construct your own solution by combining the various available technologies, uh, just as, as we've seen uh, uh, before. Uh, but there's, there's actually a simpler option, which is just to uh, plug in uh, uh, the Gigaspace's real-time analytics solution, where you can basically uh, concentrate focus on your own business logic, and the platform will take care of all the rest end-to-end, -end, which means uh, uh, the scalability and the reliability and the, the, the management and the integration with the, the various types of databases, even 
uh, uh, changing the types of databases because your code doesn't need to be uh, locked into any specific database. So all of that is uh, taken care of end-to-end, -end, both the intraday and the uh, historical data as part of one consolidated uh, real-time analytics uh, for big data. Uh, another, uh, uh, another direction for a uh, next generation of the architecture that uh, uh, we've seen quite uh, uh, an interest amongst our uh, customers and uh, deployments out there is the onboarding uh, uh, to cloud. Many organizations move to an on-demand IT infrastructure for uh, cost reduction purposes. Uh, of course, it can be a public cloud, but uh, in, in the financial services domain, uh, more interestingly, uh, is usually private cloud in the organization's data center. Of course, it could be a hybrid cloud, uh, for example, handling bursts by offloading calculations to the public cloud. Um, now, moving your standard scalable enterprise uh, application to run on the cloud infrastructure, trust me, that, that could be uh, quite, a, quite a headache. You need a, a new skill set. You need the uh, integration effort. In, uh, usually, uh, you develop on a specific cloud vendor which locks you into that vendor. Um, so it's, it's quite a headache. Um, and to make it simpler and smoother, uh, Gigaspaces offers a Cloudify product that allows you to onboard your Java application onto the cloud quite uh, seamlessly. Uh, basically, in two steps. You just need to have a preparation step, which involves mainly some uh, uh, scripts and uh, packaging. No code changes whatsoever. And the next step is deployment on the cloud. And the result would be a, an automated deployment and orchestration. And so you could appreciate how, how much simpler that is. Um, the last uh, direction that I would like to discuss for a future generation for such, um, for such uh, uh, management uh, systems and architectures and solutions is uh, when you are involved with a multi-site deployment uh, over WAM. So uh, oftentimes uh, your uh, requirements uh, uh, have mandatory uh, uh, disaster recovery uh, process that you need to embed uh, to uh, some uh, uh, disaster recovery zone uh, or just the flow itself as a multi-site activity. I, I uh, just recently consulted to a customer that had the deployment over three sites, one in London, one in Shanghai and, uh, and one in uh, Australia. So uh, these are multi-site deployment activity. And, of course, the scenarios of cloud bursting, uh, when you need to uh, serve some peak loads and uh, that are go beyond your local data center. So for that end, uh, you, uh, you have an uh, out-of-the-box uh, solution uh, with Gigaspaces uh, for multi-site activity that's quite simple. So if you already have your application installation, uh, 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 your application ri writing your data into the uh, uh, ZAP in-memory data grid, and you just want to replicate it between the sites, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, you just need to configure a gateway on each site. And as you can see, it's quite simple. Uh, just define uh, where from and where to. As you can see, the London to Hong Kong, and you define the directions and so forth. And the next step would be to deploy the gateway on each site. And that's all that's required to take your single site application and make it a multi-site application. So, uh, thank you, and uh, Sharon, that's for you. Thank you, Dotan. Thank you, Larry. Um, we'd quickly like to ask you a few poll questions um, just to see um, your interest uh, in further webinars. So, feel free to answer. Okay. And the next question. Okay, thank you very much. We would now like to address some of the questions that arose during the webinar. In the time we have, we'll try our best to answer all the questions. However, if your question remains unanswered, we'll be sure to reach out to you with an email after the webinar. So the first question was if we'll be making the slides available. Yes, they're recorded and they will be available to uh, the participants after. Um, 
this is a uh, competitive analysis question. Why should we choose Gigaspaces over other competitor products? Oh, good time. Well, uh, that's a uh, that's a uh, very uh, wide uh, uh, question because uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, competitive uh, competitor products and uh, of course uh, different subsets uh, uh, of the day of the features are compared on each case. So it's uh, very much uh, from my experience when I go and uh, consult, it's very much dependent on the exact systems uh, and what are the feature sets that are required. Uh, for uh, risk uh, analysis systems and risk uh, uh, computation that I discussed on this webinar, uh, the advantage, as I said, uh, the main advantage is, as far as I know, Gigaspaces has uh, uh, the only product out there that actually encapsulates uh, both the, the, the processing and the messaging together with the data, co-located with the data, which allows you to uh, uh, get, enjoy all of the uh, architectural aspects that I enjoy without having to develop that in-house. You get that out of the box, uh, having that uh, efficient and, of course, everything uh, being scalable via sharding the data and uh, resilient and highly available via uh, maintaining synchronous replication to, uh, to remote replicas. So all of that out of the box uh, uh, packaged, I believe that is uh, one distinct advantage that I mentioned throughout the webinar. And um, many of the extra features that I discussed very briefly at the end uh, involved uh, around the big data solutions, the uh, replication uh, over WAN, which of course uh, uh, supports much more than I elaborated, uh, like a FIFO ordering and uh, and uh, uh, filtering of results and so on, all of that uh, out of the box. Uh, uh, my discussion about onboarding to the cloud, all of that is uh, uh, quite a unique offering that, uh, that I think uh, represents a uh, uh, distinct advantage, advantage over the uh, competitive. Okay, the next question is, I have clients who use Excel. Does Gigaspace's app support Excel um, for, for these clients? Yeah, so... Um, uh, indeed, in financial services, uh, many of our customers, uh, of course, uh, uh, use uh, Excel-based uh, uh, systems because, because this is the common tool in this domain. And um, Gigaspaces offers uh, out-of-the-box uh, um, uh, support for Excel uh, and integration with Excel. Uh, so uh, we definitely support that, and uh, I, I actually encourage you to uh, have a look at that, uh, uh, download and have a look at that. Uh, similar question about .NET clients, clients that use .NET, does uh, Gigaspaces app support uh, .NET as well? Yeah, so uh, again, this is something that we see quite common in the uh, financial services, especially in banks, uh, uh, having .NET uh, uh, systems uh, uh, and Windows systems uh, in the organization. And uh, it's important to say in this context that Gigaspaces offers interoperability, uh, namely that you can develop your clients as .NET clients accessing uh, the backend, the server side that is a Java-based server side. You can even furthermore have your server side, your, your Gigaspaces app, data grid and application uh, all together on .NET if, if you so choose to. So it's definitely interoperable and uh, you can use uh, .NET clients with uh, Gigaspaces. What if I still want a backend database to back up the calculation results for auditing purposes? Yeah, so, so uh, I, I think I touched that briefly uh, over uh, over my lecture. Uh, you, you have the ability, if you still want your uh, database, uh, having your uh, data persisted to a database, you can plug in a, a database, whether a relational database or a NoSQL database, uh, to the uh, in-memory data grid, and the, the platform itself will take care of basically mirroring the data from the data grid to the persistent store, to the uh, uh, database or NoSQL database uh, automatically uh, for you. Uh, and I have another question about uh, MongoDB users. Um, if uh, I use MongoDB instead of um, a database, um, is that simple to replace with? Instead of an, I apologize, instead of an RDB, is that simple to replace with that? Um, so, uh, MongoDB, uh, and, and for that, uh, this is of course uh, for those who don't know MongoDB, this is a document-based uh, uh, 
uh, database, a NoSQL database, uh, and, and there are several other products out there, and uh, it's very interesting, again, it's part of the NoSQL uh, uh, trend that uh, I've mentioned uh, seeing uh, out there uh, in the field, and uh, uh, it's, it's actually quite important for me to say that we definitely support the uh, NoSQL databases, both MongoDB and then Cassandra and other uh, 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 sorts of document-based uh, uh, databases. I can even further say that you can even represent your data on the data grid itself uh, instead of using POJOs, you can represent them uh, as document, sort of document-based API uh, that we've launched uh, uh, on uh, ZAP version 8. Um, so you can, if you, and that's especially uh, uh, useful uh, from, from uh, the customers that the time counted uh, uh, for uh, scenarios where you have uh, very uh, uh, frequent changes in the schema and the schema evolution scenario. That's a classic scenario where you'd probably be interested in MongoDB, I assume, from your question. And what I'd like to say, not only will you have support for MongoDB, you can even represent your a, a, a flexible schema in the, in the data grid as a document-based uh, schema and have the flexibility in the data grid itself. Uh, I hope that answered the question. How big of a Java JVM heap space is used on Zap? And how do you overcome the disadvantages of 64-bit JVMs? Well, uh, Gigaspaces is basically a Java application, so uh, we're bound by the uh, uh, capabilities of the JVMs and the limitations of the JVMs. Uh, the introduction of a 64-bit uh, JVM, of course, increased dramatically uh, the volumes of uh, heap sizes that you can uh, nowadays deploy uh, effectively uh, Java applications on. So uh, you, can, uh, you can now use uh, many less nodes and bigger nodes, but of course, uh, the question would uh, revolve around the uh, performance uh, of your uh, system and uh, usually what I do uh, when I uh, uh, go to customers is basically uh, investigate the, uh, the requirements for uh, performance and uh, for uh, latency and uh, for throughput and based on that make the appropriate tuning and choose the appropriate environment. Generally speaking, uh, uh, we, we don't, we don't uh, impose any additional uh, limitations on top of the JVM, we just make the best use out of the uh, uh, current uh, abilities of the JVMs, which uh, increase uh, uh, dramatically. Is publisher subscribe messaging transactional on Zap? Um, yeah, actually, the, this is a very good question, and the, the messaging that uh, uh, capabilities that I mentioned for Zap, uh, which is basically the polling container and the notify container that I mentioned. Uh, are uh, are uh, uh, definitely transactional, which means that uh, if uh, you you poll for a certain data and uh, you got a, a failover scenario, uh, uh, you will have the backup immediately uh, coming back up and and uh, taking over uh, the task, so you don't lose any data and you don't use uh, lose any events. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Uh, I thank you all for your questions. The additional questions will be answered via email. Um, we hope you enjoyed this webinar. We'll be sending a follow-up email with links uh, for, uh, to, to view the webinar again if you'd like and other links that may be relevant. Um, thank you all for your time and have a good day.